It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Daniel Fishman. Dr. Fishman is a psychiatric oncologist at the Stanford Cancer Center and was recently appointed chief of the inpatient proactive psycho-oncology service. Today he's going to talk with us about the important psychosocial considerations of head and neck cancer survivorship. So thank you again for joining us today. I'm going to pull your slides up here for you. Thank you very much for the introduction, and thanks to everyone here for having me and letting me speak about a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. So I'm going to be talking about some of the psych psychosocial implications and impact uh, of survivorship. Wanted to at first kind of acknowledge that although we traditionally think of survivorship as the time after active treatment, a lot of the time we're actually now expanding that diagnosis because really starting on the day of diagnosis or expanding that definition because on the day of diagnosis, people are already surviving with cancer. And not only are the people you know, who are directly experiencing it survivors, but also their caregivers and loved ones are survivors because cancer is a shared experience and I think that's important to acknowledge. Psychosocial oncology is actually a field that rather than addressing cancer at the molecular or at the organ level, it's actually addressing it at the person level. It's an intersection and combination of the physical, the psychological, the social and behavioral aspects that many people experience when they're dealing with cancer. Those of us who practice it, um, we're concerned with kind of your experience as you're going through it beyond just your medical treatment how it's affecting your mood, how it's kind of what thoughts it's causing, what worries it's bringing up, issues like that. And that is including both at diagnosis, throughout active treatment, afterwards, and even kind of throughout the whole course. There's a lot of us who deal with this actually here in Stanford. We have a clinic, the Psychosocial Oncology Clinic, specifically dedicated to these issues and associated with psychiatrists, psychotherapists and counselors, nurse practitioners, social workers, kind of, and through an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary and collaborative approach, we really try to help everything that people are going through and suffering from. And that can include a wide variety, both of mood disorders, kind of the grief reaction that happens when we're dealing with cancer, all those worries that I mentioned, the fear of recurrence that we're gonna be discussing, survivor's guilt, and some of the associated physical symptoms as well that are resultant from cancer or our treatments that we're using. The fatigue you know, associated with a lot of our medications, uh, the discomfort, the uh, you know, social anxiety that can follow radiation, things like that. And it will come as no surprise to the people in this room that surviving head and neck cancer is a triumph but also presents a lot of new challenges. We have to adjust to a new normal. Uh, and that is true for people who are in remission or kind of progressing to a more maintenance stage of therapy where we're you know, participating in treatment the rest of our lives. And as our treatments improve, that means that period where we're dealing with these issues becomes longer and longer. And multiple issues can arise no matter what stage of the treatment we're in. Um, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty associated with this phase. We don't really know what's gonna come next. And as a result, that can really disrupt our transition to that new normal as we adjust to kind of, you know, what life is like after active treatment. And in fact, people in this situation result for about 25% of referrals to psychosocial oncology. So if you're experiencing any of these issues, you're certainly not alone. And in fact, over 20% of head and neck survivors experience anxiety and worries and uh, all those kind of issues that can really kind of disrupt our ability to enjoy life and function as well as we'd like to. Other than anxiety, some of the very common issues that we deal with include fatigue, uh, pain and lymphedema, whether it's you know following surgery, following radiation, um, or just you know um, removal of lymph nodes. 
intimacy challenges are actually something we don't often talk about, but they're very important. And that can be from those physical issues or that can be, you know, from our sensation that our partner doesn't understand what we went through, changes to our own how we view ourselves, changes to our self-image, or even, you know, there's a lot of stigma, unfortunately, associated with treatment. And that includes both our worries about how others are going to perceive how we now look or also how we're worried that others are going to, you know, judge us for seeking out mental health treatment. And yet, as we discussed, a lot of people are suffering in silence. They just kind of haven't, uh, you know, been able to get treatment yet. Um, as our kind of most recent presentation just covered, uh, there's a lot of issues involving oral care. Uh, you know, speech and swallow changes can interfere with incredibly important social aspects, communication, our ability to provide ourselves with nutrition, as well as, you know, just eating and drinking. If we're anxious about how we look while we eat and drink, then we're more likely to isolate from friends and family, unfortunately. It's a very social uh, activity. And then not only do people sometimes experience depressed mood, but they can also stop enjoying their hobbies. They may feel hopeless that things are never gonna get better. And they can have uh, severe guilt, unfortunately, even when there's, you know, it's when it's undeserved. And if you have unmet needs in this area, you are certainly not alone in that experience. About 50% of cancer patients experience unmet needs in this realm that can impact quality of life and psychological well being. And specifically for head and neck survivors, um, in an in depth interview, it showed that. People unfortunately weren't getting their needs met regarding certain supportive services such as counseling, uh, speech therapy, cognitive therapy, or even kind of swallowing therapy. And what makes it especially difficult is oftentimes when we're processing what we went through, processing our experience, when it really starts to hit home is when all of a sudden, you know, we're seeing our oncologist less. We're less connected to the clinic because we've kind of finished active treatment. And I think we have this expectation that, hey, we should be able to cope with this on our own. But realistically, kind of that's not the case. This is something that, again, is a shared experience and really needs to be treated as such. I wanted to specifically mention a couple aspects um, that people can sometimes experience. Survivor's guilt is unfortunately a very common one. Um, it's a deep sense of guilt experienced by those who've survived a catastrophe such as head and neck cancer that unfortunately took the lives maybe of others that you've heard about, read about, or even unfortunately personally experienced, uh, such as friends in a care uh, or support group or loved ones. And although that's kind of classically how we think about it, it, uncovers a, it encompasses a lot of different aspects as well. Sometimes we can feel survivor's guilt just because we had an easier time of treatment than others did that we know. Um, we may worry about how our cancer is impacting the lives of loved ones or our support group. We may feel that you know, we're not doing cancer well or that you know, we haven't experienced this life-changing movement where all of a sudden you know, we're running marathons or inventing you know, new inventions, winning the Nobel Prize, something that we feel this unrealistic expectation that, hey, you know, we've read about people who say it's you know, the best thing that's ever happened to them or they become this amazing new person. And we may not feel that way, and that's okay. But unfortunately, there's a lot of guilt sometimes associated with that. And I think it's also important to recognize that, you know, as much as I can talk about some of these issues, sometimes the best way to read about them and to hear about them is to actually learn from someone who's experienced them, it themselves. And that's why I included a bunch of resources up here from kind of survivors who've experienced survivor's guilt and actually kind of discuss a little bit what that looked like for them and how to cope from it. Some of the things I think are helpful for everyone are that it's okay to recognize that some days you may feel guilty and to recognize that our emotions can change from day to day, but it's okay to feel what you're feeling. That's an important aspect of adjusting to that new normal, is that emotions are gonna change and they're not always gonna be kind of ones that are positive. It's also important to recognize that, you know, we don't always have to put on a happy front. If we're feeling happy, wonderful. That's great and it's important to show that. But sometimes if we're struggling, it's okay to show that too. And I think, you know, if our caregivers, our loved ones, they want to know so that they can help. And if we don't show them that we're struggling, it's a lot harder for them to help. 
And then it's important also to recognize that it's okay to get treatment. This isn't something you have to do on your own, and there are resources out there to help, both through us at the Psychosocial Oncology Clinic as well as a whole bunch of other resources at Stanford and elsewhere that uh, I have some slides on later. Fear of recurrence is unfortunately one of the major types of anxiety that we tend to see in this period. Uh, it's highly prevalent not only in the people who've directly themselves gone through cancer, but also in caregivers and loved ones. We may you know, be so worried about possible recurrence that we have intrusive thoughts that interfere with our lives no matter what we're doing. They can cause anxiety such that we feel stuck in our own head, that we feel isolated, that we can't really participate you know, uh, in personal relationships because when we're trapped in our own minds, it's hard to focus on what's outside of our head. And when others don't seem to recognize what we're going through, that can make us very upset or irritable. And unfortunately, fear of recurrence often occurs you know, in not only kind of that adjustment period after we've gone through acute treatment when we're receiving less supports, but it very commonly comes back, you know, in the days or weeks before maintenance or uh, surveillance visits, before checkups, and especially before scans. I think, you know, there's actually a specific term called scanxiety, just because it's so common. And I think that this is something that isn't talked about as enough, unfortunately. Um, so I, it's important to recognize that just because we feel that anxiety, that's part of the process. That doesn't mean that we are experiencing a recurrence. So I talked about all these you know, very challenging situations, and I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't leave everyone with some optimism and some hope and what can actually help um, for those of us who are experiencing this. So not only you know, the issues that I discussed, but also other issues involving how we're adjusting or coping with kind of our new situation, with that new normal, with our diagnosis, with our treatment, as well as the mood and associated physical symptoms that can occur with this, whether that's fatigue, whether that's changes in how we're able to concentrate, changes to our memory, changes on how we're able to think, um, chronic pain, and that a lot of these issues there are supports for, but again, if we don't kind of acknowledge what we're experiencing, then it's harder to reach out to supports. And usually what that support looks like is a combination of different interventions that we tailor uh, you know, based on kind of your needs. This can include therapy such as counseling, it can include medications that kind of help with those physical symptoms, you know, appetite, sleep, pain, but also the depression directly or the worries directly that we're experiencing. Um, speech kind of in swallowing therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and kind of other um, you know, interventions as well, you know, yoga, exercise, mindfulness, things like that can all be very powerful. And I think kind of as caregivers and loved ones, one thing that you all can do to kind of help uh, your loved one who's experiencing cancer directly to get through this is to help them recognize that, hey, as challenging and as terrible as this experience was, now that you're in this new normal, it actually may not be all bad. There may be some positives that when people have been able to recognize, that's actually improved their quality of life. Whether that's kind of the growth they went through, whether it's reestablishing connections with family and appreciation for certain aspects of their life, or even just realignment of their priorities. Maybe the job you've hated for 20 years isn't worth going back to. Things like that can actually have a powerful impact. And thankfully for a lot of these interventions and counseling that were dis uh, measures that we're discussing, they actually are backed by evidence. Whether that's cognitive behavioral therapy, such as uh, helping people recognize the connection that our thoughts, um, emotions, and behaviors have and how they all interplay together surrounding cancer whether it's acceptance and commitment therapy, helping people accept kind of how they're feeling and commit to kind of more action-oriented plans of behavioral change, meaning-centered psychotherapy. A big part of this new adjustment, this new normal, is to find what is meaningful for you. And I think you know, that's something therapy can be very helpful for. And whether you're using kind of apps on your phone or you know, uh, meditation exercises, mindfulness, that living in the present and experiencing what you're experiencing 
can really help decrease our worries about the future or our ruminations about the past. And then I know I touched on it very briefly, but physical activity and exercise is huge. Not only does it help with fatigue, but it's also been shown to help with depression. Um, behavioral activation is uh, behavioral inactivation is something we see a lot at this stage. Um, people are kind of feeding, you know, the negative emotions. They're doing as little as possible because, honestly, that's what they feel like doing. And yet, if we can push ourselves even just a tiny bit past that, that actually helps us build healthier habits and really kind of fight back against any depression we may be feeling. And again, I'm not talking about running marathons here. I certainly don't run marathons. That is not something that I can do or expect other people to do. But this is just the activity that we can do, an appropriate level that your body can do. And yet if we're not motivated to do that, oftentimes we don't recognize where that threshold is. So here's a very important slide on the right way to grieve. It'll probably surprise none of you that this slide is blank. <laughs> That's because a quote that I really like is, there is no right way to grieve. There's only your way to grieve, and that's different for everyone. And so it's hard, I think, to sometimes to accept this because it would be great if there was a three-step plan about how to grieve successfully and get over the grief process and be able to move on with our lives. Unfortunately, really everyone goes through that process in their own way. And I think that that is something that actually can be a positive thing because it means it's something that you have control over and that other people don't get to dictate. And unfortunately, when we're talking about cancer treatment, oftentimes those situations can feel in short supply. And I think kind of, you know, while there's no right way to grieve, if grief is getting to the point where it's interfering and disrupting your ability to adjust to that new normal, if that's all you, your body is able to, and your brain is able to process, then I think that's time to, you know, help get some treatment because it shouldn't be the only thing. It should be something, it should be a step along the way. And I think that grief, you know, when I say grief here, I'm referring not only to the loss of loved ones, uh, loss of friends, but also to the loss of our ability to function, our ability to do certain things. And I think that's very important to recognize. And then for caregivers and loved ones, social support plays a huge role. And I think, you know, when we're struggling with grief or with other issues, um, it's important for us to be our own advocate and reach out to those loved ones when we are suffering. And it's been shown that if we're able to do that and receive that support, that actually decreases depression, helps reduce distress, and can restore our self-confidence our self -confidence in our ability to return to our normal life. And again, this is the new normal. Our ability to manage kind of those persistent symptoms, those persistent physical symptoms, whether it's pain, trouble swallowing, trismus, uh, fatigue, you know, trouble concentrating, and it helps us regulate our emotions as well. But it's also important to recognize that caregivers need support too. And I think, you know, that's something, again, that also doesn't get talked about enough because this is a very challenging situation for everyone involved. And there are resources out there, both at Stanford as well as through other national organizations such as the American Cancer Society and the cancer support community. And then whether we're talking about caregivers or those, of, those who have directly experienced cancer, um, in addition to our own clinic, Stanford has a cancer survivorship program with a lot of great resources and a supportive care program um, overlapping with that where they can connect people with some of that individualized and personal therapies, whether that's kind of connecting people with support groups, whether it's uh, you know getting them associated with kind of treatments that they would prefer outside of medications. There's a lot of alternative resources out there and information and kind of lectures and just further uh, resources to help, uh, you know, help us help, uh, help us deliver the help to you guys that you may need. Well, thank you all for your time, and I really appreciate you letting me come and uh, talk with you. I'll, thank you.